force it. Pursuant to order, I now call Senator Darmanin to make her first speech and ask senators that the usual courtesies be extended to her. I call Senator Darmanin. Thank you, President, for your welcome. <clears throat> I want to acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people who have called this place home for tens of thousands of years. I acknowledge their continuous connection to this land and pay my respects to community members and elders, past, present and emerging. Sovereignty was never ceded and never will be. I also pay my respects to the First Nations people across Victoria who have been enduring custodians of the beautiful state I have called home my whole life. We must listen, learn and start a real dialogue about what has happened throughout our history, what is happening now and what needs to be done to advance justice and equality for all First Nations people. It would be impossible to begin today without acknowledging my predecessor, comrade and dear friend, Linda White. During what has been a challenging time, I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to the Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, Tim Ayres and Andrew Giles for their unwavering support for Linda, her staff and to me. Linda was a giant of our movement and her legacy and impact on the lives of working people in this country is immense and everlasting. I worked with Linda for all my 24 years at the Australian Services Union until her election to the Senate. Among other things, Linda was a walking, talking masterclass in smart and fierce advocacy. Linda and I spent a lot of time in the trenches together, always focused on the path to a win and never forgetting the people in politics. She was always driven by the people she met along the way, and she carried their stories, struggles and aspirations into those fights. Linda's ASU office was always open to members and her senator's office was always open to the community. I will work hard to live up to that standard. Linda's passing forced me to think about the times in our lives when we have an opportunity and a responsibility to make a difference beyond our own lives and families. Ultimately, ultimately as I stand proud in her shoes today, it was Linda who led me here. That sense of responsibility runs back to my earliest memory of politics, or as I understood it as a kid, standing up for what is right. My dad, Vince, was a fitter and turner at a Melbourne glass factory and a proud Australian Manufacturing Workers' Union delegate. During the Kennett years, while bargaining, his employer locked him out of his workplace and they sent police to break up the picket line. They stopped his pay for three months during that strike. My first part-time job, my, my part job was at Safeway, where I helped pay for family food and bills during that strike, and of course I was a member of both the SDA and the Meat Workers Union. It's fair to say I've been on a few picket lines since then, more recently with my own kids, and I never fail to be moved by the power of working people, risking everything they have to demand dignity and fair treatment for themselves and other people. I've also been inspired by countless members and delegates from the mighty ASU, many of whom are here tonight. Melanie, Barry, Marie, Simon, Kim, Anne, and so many more. They are from every part of the state and the country and all walks of life, making our workplaces and communities fairer for everyone. They come from hundreds of different professions, social and welfare work, town planning, road maintenance, aged care, horticulture, customer service and finance, just to name a few. Members and delegates are the lifeblood of our union movement. They right wrongs on a daily basis, stand up for workmates, negotiate enterprise agreements, safeguard democracy in our unions and win extraordinary workplace reforms like pay equity and family violence leave. They do all of this as volunteers, often at a personal cost, fuelled by the cause and by, helping for, and by helping their fellow workers. Every job, whether you are an engineer, aged care worker or a street sweeper, should provide dignity through fair pay and conditions. Unions powered by their members are the backbone of protecting and advancing rights. It is our duty to ensure that the principles of fairness, honesty and integrity guide everything we do, creating a community where everyone is treated with the respect they deserve. 
At the Australian Services Union, I rep represented thousands of underpaid and undervalued workers across local government and the community sector. It has been the highlight of my career to fight alongside them, to win improvements that make people's lives easier and workplaces fairer. This includes working alongside giants like Linda, Sally McManus, Michelle O'Neill and so many other colleagues here tonight on the landmark equal pay case for the community sector, along with enterprise agreements covering tens of thousands of workers in dozens of industries where members have done one additional leave, entitlements and flexibility. I am especially, especially proud of working with Victorian Labor to achieve portable long service leave in the community sector. I want to thank my Victorian State Labor colleagues for their support, some of whom are also here tonight. Another highlight is when Surf Coast Shire Council became the first workplace in the world to enshrine enforceable entitlements to paid family violence leave. Not many people here would know that. The campaign for family violence leave started at a regional Victorian council in a community known more for waves than workers' rights. That was achieved through the courage of a workplace delegate talking about her own experience of family violence, the support of the Geelong Trades Hall Women's Committee and the skill, smarts and solidarity of people like Julie Kuhn and Barry Miller to make the case with management. Following this, ASU members fought to make this a state and national standard. And in 12 years, we completed the job under the Albanese government. Thank you to my ASU comrades who truly embody the saying, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. To Emmeline Gasky, sister, for your unwavering support and solidarity. To Billy, Wayne, Imogen, David, Cassie, Neil, Jenny, Abby, Scott, Angus, Alex, Graham and Robert, your loyalty and determination are unparalleled. And to Michelle Jackson, the toughest and most courageous person I know. You have taught me the value of doing what's right, even when it's not popular. To Tash and Zoe, the next generation of ASU Vic Taz trailblazers, I am excited to see what our beloved union is capable of under your leadership, together with Ty Leon and the whole team. Leonie Morgan, your mentorship has been invaluable to me. Thanks for guiding me and supporting me through my journey. Your wisdom and encouragement have profoundly impacted my life and career. Another win where ASU members and the union movement stood tall is the reform to pay superannuation on government, paid, on government parental leave, which disproportionately affects women who take 99.5 per cent of government paid parental leave in Australia. This would not have been possible without fierce ASU members like Adele, who trod these halls with other working women to talk about their fears of retiring in poverty after a lifetime of work. Throughout my career, I have been deeply involved in industry superannuation as the custodian of, working, of workers' retirement savings. Super, superannuation is a proud legacy of Labor governments, and the success of universal superannuation is critical to working people's security and their dignity in retirement. It is a model to be proud of, reflecting the common good and a strong partnership between employers and employees. Before this job, I loved every minute of being the chair of Vision Super, a $13.5 billion fund covering 85,000 members working in local government in Victoria and other industries. Australia's superannuation system is the envy of the world, and it should continue to be. It must not be used as a national bank account, as some would like to see. I will always be a fierce advocate for a dignified retirement, not just as a privilege for the rich, but a right for every worker after a lifetime of hard work. Nevertheless, there are still inequalities in our current system. Women punished for taking time out of the workplace to care for families, younger workers who often juggle multiple jobs and those in insecure work facing a range of challenges. I look forward to tackling these. More broadly, respect for women and their work is still unfinished business in this country. This needs to change. I have worked for most of my career seeing professional and dedicated care workers forced to beg for public funding crumbs 
in order to be paid what they are truly worth. Their work is demanding. It requires the head and the heart and the skills to navigate flawed systems. It's their work that builds critical social infrastructure for all of us. These are jobs that require not only tertiary qualifications, but incredible skill and judgment, where decisions some workers make on a daily basis could mean the difference between life and death for the people they support. And while we see the true costs of physical infrastructure budgeted and covered, the people who build our social infrastructure are left to argue why their work matters over and over again. Fair pay, secure employment, pay increases and indexation should be built into funding agreements rather than seen as luxuries. The Australian Workplace Gender Equality Agency indicates that reducing the gender pay gap in Australia will have a multiplier effect on the economy. For every 1 per cent reduction in the gender pay gap, the Australian economy could gain an additional $8 billion. Fixing the gender pay gap would be, should be seen as an economic priority as well as a social one. We have made leaps with labour. Equal pay for community workers, a 15 per cent pay rise just this month for early childhood educators. We must continue on this trajectory and continue to invest. This will strengthen economic performance by driving women's participation in the labour market and increasing productivity. It will ensure better retirement outcomes and it will begin to level the playing field. We, have, we will have slammed the door shut on, on the gender pay gap once and for all. I am excited by the government's new gender equality strategy, which has already done important work in shining the light on unacceptable corporate practices, such as 38 companies with a gender pay gap of over 50 per cent. Just last week, ABS data showed that our national gender pay gap is now the lowest on record, falling to 11.5 per cent. This is no coincidence. Banning pay secrecy, enforcing gender pay gap reporting and putting gender equity at the heart of the Fair Work Commission's decision-making are deliberate policies of the Albanese government. The government's strategy, very importantly, also tackles how we must confront, confront violence against women. We all have a role to play in addressing this national crisis, and I intend to use my position to be a part of that collective effort. We know the numbers. A woman is killed every 11 days by a current or former partner. One quarter of Australian women will experience intimate partner violence in their lifetime. Unacceptable. For our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander sisters, rates of violence are disproportionately higher. First Nations women are six times more likely to be killed by their intimate partner or family, and 33 times more likely to be hospitalised due to a family violence-related assault. More unfinished business. I am proud to come from the state of Victoria, where I spent some time working in family violence reform. At that time, our Victorian state Labor government had invested more than all other states and the Commonwealth combined to lead this work beginning with the Royal Commission in 2016. I am proud that the Albanese government is leading a renewed national effort to address the drivers of violence against women through the national plan. And in doing so, I come back to workplace equality measures. Like closing the gender pay gap, gender inequality must be addressed if we want to prevent violence against women. When women are paid less, Based on gender assumptions, it sends the message that they are of less value than men, less worthy of respect, making violence against them more likely. If we want to accelerate an end to family violence, then we must fund this work properly. We must encourage women's independence and decision-making at work, home and in public life. We must reform boldly and construct new social norms. Australia as a nation and Australians of all gender identities will be better off for the work that we do today. Like most of us, the first collective I come from uh, that I was a part of was my family. My mum, a second generation Australian whose parents hail from Rochester in central Victoria. She is the embodiment of quiet dignity, determination and care. Growing up, she was, and still is, always there to support my two sisters and I. Mum was a student of the same primary school that my children now attend, 
and she lives around the corner in a house that my grandpa Tom renovated many times over when they relocated to the city. Mum has helped Luke and I keep it all together for our family, often helping out at very short notice. She carries the load without hesitation or complaint. Without you, Mum, I would not be the person I am today. There she is. I mentioned my dad, Vince, who migrated to Australia from Libya in the 1960s as a 10-year-old boy without a word of English. Like many other Australians, his family left home searching for safety and a better future. I am fortunate to know his history and to also be connected to my Italian heritage. Thank you to my dad, uncle and auntie and other family members who are here tonight. You have helped me understand and appreciate where I come from. Growing up, my primary school tuck shop sold homemade spring rolls for 20 cents. My mates' mums made them by their family recipes that they carried here in their heads as refugees from the Vietnam War. Decades later, I see the same pattern at work in my kids' primary school, where 65% of students speak a language other than English at home, like Urdu, Nepali and Persian. Diversity and difference are the magic that make our local communities into the places we love and Melbourne into one of the most vibrant cities in the world. The politics of fear and division help no one and hurt us all. We must stand up for what's right because hope will always triumph over hate. Thank you to my husband, Luke. There he is. <laughs> Who shares the family and professional load as we raise our two sons, Harvey and Daniel. I wouldn't be standing here today without your encouragement. Since Luke and I first met, our endeavours for a better world have always been a joint project. I treasure your calm influence, wise counsel and unwavering support. Thank you for being the best father of young boys any feminist mum could ever want. <laughs> and to my two boys, Harvey and Daniel, you are clever, curious and very, very energetic. <laughs> You've been campaigning since you were born and I can already see that these experiences have taught you the value of standing up for, for what you believe in. I want to make you proud of what I can achieve in this place. Your generation will face a tougher world than mine in many ways, but you and your friends give me great hope that the kids are up to the challenge. The third prong in my support crew is the Glenroy West Mums Village. <laughs> Charmaine, Kaori, Donna and especially Debbie and Matt, thank you for your friendship, humour and sometimes very last minute support in the chaos that is our lives. Finally, a shout out to my sisters, Kristen and Erin, who have always been my biggest fans, standing, standing ready to provide frank, fearless and honest feedback whenever I need it. And yes, I am finally willing to concede that singing and dancing in the Johnny Young Talent Time crew was not the career path I thought it would be. <laughs> Thank you to my extended family members who've made the trek from Queensland, country New South Wales and Victoria to be here tonight. Special mention to Grandma Grace, still sharp as a tack at 94, who I know is watching this live from Melbourne. One of my reasons for being here is that I have seen firsthand what good governments are capable of. I know what government is for. Governments hold a unique responsibility, delivering high quality public services that are essential to the well-being of our communities. It can be the difference between violence and safety, crisis and hope, and two completely different paths in life. Government funding underpins our social, health and economic safety nets. Medicare, Centrelink, public schools, the NDIS, and vital community sectors like family violence, homelessness, mental health, and legal centres. More than that, they are sporting clubs, public parks and playgrounds, libraries, swimming pools, and community centres. We rely on government service, services every day of our lives. Most Australians might never expect to face a natural disaster or emergency or anticipate needing early intervention or crisis services. But we all should care that they are well-funded and ready to respond when we do. 
These services are the foundation upon which individuals and communities can thrive. They are a promise that everyone matters and that governments will have our backs when the worst imaginable things happen. A key measure of any government's success is how it values and invests in its most disadvantaged members. Not only is it the right thing to do, but the social, economic and community cohesion benefits are immense. On that note, I am excited to join the Albanese Labor government. This government is working hard for people and their aspirations. I join the team with a sharp understanding of the importance of making time in government count. At the same time, every government needs strong voices within the caucus and advocates in the community to help keep them on track. I will be one of those voices, speaking <coughs> up when it matters, even when that might be difficult. Or, as Linda would often say, sometimes we need someone else to show us our best selves. In all of the roles that I've held, I have loved elevating everyday people's voices and fighting alongside them for change. I might be on the other side of the desk now, but I want to keep elevating community voices and ensuring decision makers can hear them loudly and clearly. My promise to the parliament and to the people of Victoria as your representative is to be on the side of working people, removing the barriers to dignity at work and good jobs, and working to ensure everyone can enjoy a good retirement when they've done their time in the workforce. It's been a great privilege to learn from and work alongside so many union and labour colleagues in Victoria for decades. I'd like to thank colleagues and comrades from the United Workers' Union, Australian Manufacturing Workers' Union, the Electrical Trades Union, the Community Public Sector Union and the Finance Sector Union, along with Matt Hilakari, Kat Hardy and Casey Nunn for your support. And thank you to all the Victorian Labor members who have supported my journey to this place. To my office staff, We've been working together for a relatively short time, but I already feel so very lucky that you've chosen to work with me. Amit, Eid, Ekta, Grace and Rose, thank you for your energy, professionalism, good humour, fine appreciation of excellent treats and uh, the team nickname of the Dharma Knights. I thank my caucus colleagues for your very supportive and generous welcome to this place. The Labor Party's core values, fairness, equality, dignity and justice, are, are our collective strength. We can only achieve the transformative change that our community needs from us by working together to deliver on the promise of government. The services people need, fair pay and work for all, and just social, economic and environmental outcomes for today, tomorrow and the generations to come. I stand here with a strong sense of responsibility to make my time in the Senate count and to make our time in government matter. Thank you. Here, here. Thank you, Senator Garner.